the problem when you're sharing the iPad. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. All right, so I just wanted to say a few words before I pass the, uh, the word to, to, to Jose, who will be uh, chairing the session. Since it's our, it's our last session of this workshop, I just wanted to share a few, um, few reflections for me personally. Maybe it would be nice at some point to have a little discussion about this, but I think by the end of today, we will all be a little bit tired. And um, I think for me, it's been really extremely interesting and, and, um, and a very valuable set of sessions. So of course, I would like to thank hugely um, my co-organizers, Jose and uh, Yuri, who also gave the mini courses. I know that was a lot of work <laughs> the last two or three weeks, but I hope that these mini courses will remain. Of course, they're all on YouTube, so they will be kind of their definitive mini courses on Young Towers and Market Partitions. And um, so I, I remember, I, I feel very old saying this, but you know, I remember when I was a student and once uh, at a conference, I heard John Hubbard, he said he was working on complex, two-dimensional complex Henon map, complex dynamics. And I remember at the beginning of the talk, he said, well, there is a, there is a fierce competition here between uh, J what John Hubbard himself was doing. And then there was Bedford and Smiley had also written a kind of whole series of papers. And he said, you know, there's a competition. We're using two different methods and Bedford is smiling and winning hands down and really going very far. And at some point during this talk, I kind of had a little bit that during this workshop, I had a little bit that feeling, you know, all these, uh, somehow these Markov partitions are really winning hands down, you know, on young towers. <laughs> they are, uh, they are able to capture so much information, so much dynamics, there's so many applications. Then as, as the week went on, I started to feel a little bit less that way. And I really, um, I think this week has helped me to understand that the two methods are not competing methods. They really are methods that can um, help each other in some sense. You know, they have different strengths and weaknesses. And I think it, is a really valuable opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about all these results that use the Markov partitions and how, uh, you know, it's really um, uh, <clears throat> it's really about understanding non-uniform hyperbolic system and using using all various tools that are adapted to particular situations. So um, I come out of this with this. Uh, with this very positive feeling about how, you know, how these various techniques are not as foreign to each other as, as they seemed from the beginning. So um, I hope this feeling is shared by the others. I hope anyway that it's been useful for everyone else, everybody else. And I'm uh, very much looking forward now to the last talk. Uh, so I will pass uh, the speaker, the mic, the microphone to Jose Alves, who uh, will present the last talk and wrap up the uh, workshop. Okay, thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, I would like to start thanking my the co-organizers of this meeting. It was a very uh, a great pleasure to organize uh, all these sessions. Uh, and, and I would like to thank especially Yuri because he did half of, of my job for this afternoon. I was supposed to be the, the chairman for this, uh, this session, but uh, we had uh, internet problems, actually energy problems here in Porto. And so I, I couldn't attend the, the beginning of the first lecture. So uh, our next lecture is, is, uh, from, uh, is by uh, Snir ben Ovadia from uh, Penn State University. And he will talk about uh, zero summable orbits. Stay, please. Yes, thank you very much. While I share my screen, let me start by saying also my appreciation for this week, which was wonderful for me and for organizing the week beforehand. 
So, of course, uh, I'm thanking the organizers for this weekend for giving me the opportunity to take a part. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So, uh, let's start. Today, I want to talk about zero summable orbits. Before we go into the technical slides, I can give an overview of the main results that we want to discuss today. So, first, we introduce a class of orbits which may have zero Lyapunov exponents, but still exhibit sensitivity to initial conditions. We'll see what it means. And the first result we mentioned is that we construct a Markov partition, a countable Markov partition, which induces a finite to one almost every coding. And as importantly, it lifts the geometric potential with summable variations. And part of the technique which is used in order to construct the Markov partition is the graph transform, uh, which I'll explain the difficulties with this and how it's how they are overcome. Um, and the graph transform allows us to construct weak, stable, and unstable leaves. These are local manifolds which may contract in a strictly sub exponential uh, way. Uh, we show the absolute continuity of those foliations. And then we give a general condition for the existence of such uh, uh, foliations in a system. And then we continue with a family of examples where we can simultaneously code in a finite to one almost everywhere manner, all the invariant measures in the system without assuming chi hyperbolicity for some chi. Um, and basically I should say that this is a consisting of two results. One is general and one is a, the study of a, a class of examples. So this part will be more specific. And then part six and seven are again general and they relate to the general construction uh, of what measures can be coded with this coding we have. Um, let's start with the framework and the definition. So the framework is M is a closed D-dimensional Riemannian manifold. Closed means compact and boundaryless. D is greater or equal to two. And F is a one plus beta diffeomorphism of the manifold, which means that F and its inverse are differentiable and both the differentials are beta Heldel continuous for some positive beta. And now we want to introduce this notion of zero summability. So a point in the manifold is called zero summable or sometimes summable in short, if its tangent space splits uniquely into a direct sum of uh, stable and unstable subspaces, ages and ages respectively, where we have that for every tangent vector on the stable subspace, oops, one second. Uh, let me see if it's working. Okay, good. For every stable, uh, a tangent vector in the stable subspace, this quantity is finite. And for every tangent vector in the unstable subspace, this quantity is finite. So what can we see from this definition immediately? That every uh, hyperbolic orbit satisfies this condition. Um, and also it is lean in the sense that there is no choice in this expression, except maybe for the number two here. But uh, as we will see next, we want this quantity to be a norm on the tangent space, which is induced from an inner product. So the parallelogram law tells us that it has to be two here for this property to hold. So there's really not much choice, but I will circle back to this um, a definition in two slides or three slides later on to see another feature of it. So let's continue. The first step in the construction is the oscillated spacing reduction. So we start by uh, constructing the Lyapunov inner product on tangent spaces of summable points. Uh, for every two tangent vectors at, at a summable point, they decompose uniquely into their stable and unstable components. And then we define a new inner product on the stable subspace um, according to this formula, which is well-defined by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and the fact that X is summable. Um, and similarly, we define an inner product on the unstable subspace. Given this formula, and they both extend to an inner product on the whole tangent space of X uh, through taking the respective inner product as the respective components. The next step is to do the Lyapunov change of coordinates at these points. So the Lyapunov change of coordinates is a matrix, which depends on the point from the D-dimensional Euclidean space to the tangent space of X, such that when we consider two tangent vectors at X, their new inner product, which we define, equals to the standard Euclidean inner product of their pre-images under this map. Now this formula defines the map uh, C0 of X 
defines it up to an orthogonal, orthogonal mapping of HS or HU. Um, so we have a degree of freedom first to choose that HS of X, the stable subspace, is mapped to the first S of X coordinates in, in RD, where S of X is the dimension of HS of X. And it still leaves us with a degree of freedom of uh, choosing this map up to orthogonal mappings of HS and HU. But uh, we don't care about this for two reasons. One, the quantity that we are truly interested in is the norm of the inverse, which is of course not affected by a composition with an orthogonal map. Secondly, um, this matrix as a function of X can be chosen measurably over the set of zero summable points, even though it's not defined uniquely, it can be chosen measurably. So we are happy. Um, let's continue. Oops, that's that. Good. Um, so the next uh, definition we want to, to introduce is temporability. So let's start with weak temporability or epsilon weak temporability for some positive epsilon. We say that a zero summable point is zero, uh, sorry, is epsilon weakly temporable if you have a function from the orbit of the point into this discrete set. Now, what is this discrete set? It doesn't really uh, matter how you choose this set. It just needs to have some correspondence with the variation bounds here. We'll circle back to it in a second, but it just needs to be a discrete set which goes to zero and refines those levels. Um, good, so with two properties we want to be satisfied are that first, this function is bounded by a constant over the inverse Lyapunov norm to some power two gamma. And you can immediately notice that this property of weak temporability depends on epsilon and on a gamma. Um, and secondly, we want this variation, the multiplicative variation over the orbit to be bounded with e to the plus minus epsilon. That's the second condition, okay? Now, don't worry about uh, what is gamma, it's just a parameter, which for now we allow to be any choice of parameter. Um, and we will see why it appears later on. Now we have strong temperability. Strong temperability is similar and we'll explain how it extends the notion of weak temperability. So uh, we say that the zero summable point is strongly temperable if there is a function from the orbit of the point into this discrete set. And now let's define this discrete set. First, uh, consider this map I of X equals X times E to the gamma X to the power of one over gamma. I know it seems daunting, but trust me, it makes a, a lot of sense. You'll see in a second. Um, and then we want to have uh, a choice, another choice doesn't really matter which choice we make, but let's choose this one, this discrete set, uh, which refines levels of I and goes to zero, where let me write it down, um, I minus one over four is the fourth iterative root of the inverse of I. So exists. Um, now this is like a, a set of a uh, ladder levels on which we can climb or go down. And again, we want this function to be dominated by a constant over this uh, inverse Lyapunov norm to the power of uh, two gamma. And we want now the variation over the orbit to be bounded with respect to I instead of with respect to E to the plus minus epsilon. So let's just for one second, see what it means. It means that whenever Q is very small, so without being formal at this point, when Q is small, it represents bad parts of the space. So whenever we are in the bad parts of the space, when Q is very small, the, the tightness of this estimate becomes much stronger because Q can be much smaller than epsilon. You fix one epsilon in the beginning of the construction, then Q is, can always become arbitrarily smaller than epsilon. So you see that the factor which approximates the closeness of those two quantities becomes much smaller. And in particular, if you substitute um, I of X equals X to the E epsilon, you get exactly the definition of weak temporality. So it's simply replacing this function with a more restrictive function. Uh, and the passing temperate kernel lemma tells us that every invariant probability measure, which is hyperbolic, is carried by the set of epsilon weakly temporable points for every epsilon. 
Okay. Let me sneak. Let me sneak. Yes. 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 Question. Sure. Uh, in in i plus i plus minus one of q of is, q is 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 this an inequality, is this an inequality or, or an identity? Inequality, sorry, let me write it down explicitly. Um, it's Q of F less than I of Q greater you. than you. I minus one of Q, where minus one means the inverse, not the one over, the iterative inverse. Um, okay, so uh, what did I want to say is that We'll go back later to see why this form of the function i is quite natural, okay? Now, let me give one more definition before we state the main result. And the definition is points which are recurrently strongly temporable. So we saw what is strong temporability, but if this function q can be chosen so it's slim soup forward and backwards in time is positive, then we say it's recurrently. Weakly temporal, it means that it returns to some regular level set of Q infinitely often in the past and the future. And then we present the next theorem, which is uh, there is a countable Markov partition R, which induces a locally finite a countable directed graph G and the factor map from the induced topological Markov shift into the manifold. And I'm not defining those terms because I know that the audience now knows all those terms. So uh, such that Pi is uniformly continuous on sigma, while sigma may be not non-compact. Two, when we restrict pi to sigma sharp, what is sigma sharp? It is the set of all, point, all chains which have a symbol occurring infinitely often in the future and another perhaps different symbol occurring infinitely often in the past. So when we restrict pi to this set, it is finite, the, the factor map is finite to one, it's coding. Um, we have this commutativity relation and the image of sigma sharp equals to the Markov partition, the union of all the elements, which equals to the set of frequently uh, strongly temporal points. And another important property is that the geometric potential lifts with summable variation. Um, so uh, let me mention a result uh, by Bouzy, which says that if one wishes to code all hyperbolic measures simultaneously, when you allow a uh, chi to be arbitrarily small, then you cannot hope for pi to be uh, held or continuous. So indeed, this is not the case, but luckily we get that the map pi is uh, uh, uniformly continuous and furthermore, it lifts the geometric potential with some of our variations, which is the threshold requirement for carrying out the thermodynamic formalism of countable Markov shift. So we're happy. And now I will say, the main ideas of the construction, and because again, I know the audience is an expert on Markov partitions and specifically Sarig's theory, I will compare the differences with uh, Sarig's theory. And then I will show why those five items are sufficient in order to construct the Markov partition with the property of one. So the first property we need is that we have this process of coarse graining which is done by for the set of frequently strongly temporal points. But you want on each level set where you take a sufficiently, uh, not dense because it's a finite set, but sufficiently uh, like finitely dense set. And you want it to be closer. You want it to be closer to respect to the choice of the map I. And you want the discreteness property, which basically means that um, whenever uh, the minimum of PS and PU is a, a greater or equal to some positive number, then the number of uh, double charts which satisfy this is finite. This is the discreteness property we want. And this object is basically a triplet of a point, which is recurrently strongly temporal, and two neighborhoods of it. That's what this triplet is. Um, and I want to say that perhaps if one seeks out to code all hyperbolic measures, then one can try naively to work with, a, with charts which have another parameter, let's call it chi x, which is some discretized um, a way of uh, choosing the Lyapunov exponent at x. And then one can also try to, to have an appropriate inner product at the 
uh, Lyapunov linear product where you put another factor here, which would be a to let's say chi x. So you would impose some exponential contraction in this uh, uh, quantity. But morally, this is wrong because a Lyapunov exponent is not the property of a point, it's the property of the tail of an orbit. And similarly, it's not the property of a symbol, it's the property of the tail of a chain. So if one seeks out to code all hyperbolic measures, you cannot have a, that a symbol holds the property of the tail because it will break the Markovian property. So you need to find uh, an underlying structure which is common to all hyperbolic measures together. Um, okay, so now we have this uh, refined edge condition and I compare it with Sarit's uh, definition of an edge. Um, so the first uh, condition is that those quantities are small. How small doesn't really matter, but they are uh, sufficiently small. And then we have this property, which is perhaps, uh, I mean, if allow me to say it, it's the most important idea in Tsaik's work, which allows you to define the, these parameters in a grid algorithm way along the orbits, which in the end allows you to solve the inverse problem. So uh, in Sarig's construction, you just substitute i of x equals x times e to the epsilon. Now we want to have some finer structure, so we define it similarly. And I call it i is just a discrete lattice. And we, when we say i of a number, we mean the closest lattice point greater or equal to the number. That's what we mean. So we have uh, this definition of the gate algorithm now. So when we are in bad parts of the, of the space, it means that edges, uh, the, the window parameters change much slower. The variation is smaller. And we have another step which is necessary, which is the graph transform for chains which don't have uniform contraction in charge. So the uh, idea which, which uh, or let's say the engine behind the Sykes coding is passing theory. Passing theory tells us that uh, when we take hyperbolic orbit, we can find a change of coordinates, which locally puts the action of uh, the differential in a block form matrix, which is hyperbolic. And furthermore, not only it's hyperbolic, it is, a uniformly hyperbolic up when we have a second order error term, but it, it, at the point it is uniformly hyperbolic with some fixed chi. And then we use this uniform hyperbolicity to prove uh, using Pono Damal methods, we use convergence of graph transform. In this setup, even after we go into charts, we, don't, we no longer have uniform estimates. It's, uh, you could say, a heuristically, it's like non-uniform, non-uniform hyperbolicity. So one needs to carry out this graph transform to show that it converges uh, without the uniform uh, estimates within charts and uh, after a change of coordinates. And not only this, you want to be able to show that the C1 convergence is fast enough. So you end up having summable variations to lift the geometric potential. And this can be done on what we call lift force, which are smaller portions of the, of the lift, which still contain all codable points. So it's good enough because we just want the tangent space to codable points. Um, and then we need the next step we do, that we need is an improved inverse problem. So what is the improved inverse problem? It says that if we have two chains, which are recurrent and they code the same uh, point, then these quantities, basically what you wish to estimate is the inverse uh, Lyapunov norm. They are close to each other with respect to to i. So as we uh, stress, this means that when this norm is very big, this requires this approximation to be much, much tighter than just e to the plus minus epsilon. So we are left with uh, two uh, difficulties, which together are uh, much harder to deal with. It's the fact that we have weaker estimates in charts and simultaneously we want to get stronger bounds. Um, but now assume that we have items one, two, three, four, five. Let's see why it's enough to have the Markov partition. It's, a, it's enough for the following reason. We start with a point which is currently strongly temperable. And then we have Le Drapier's formula, which tells us that a, given the fact that X is strongly temperable, we can find a window parameters, PU and PS. So it has a chain. Uh, using the edge condition. 
uh, which uh, shadows it. Um, what the Drapier formula is exactly this formula when i of x is x to the epsilon, but when i of x is uh, another function, it works similarly as long as that you have the adapted strong temporability condition. Okay. Um, then notice that this function i of x, let me do this. For simplification, I will just write x here instead of gamma. Um, notice that this function uh, is uh, strictly increasing and uh, it's always uh, greater than x, it's expanding. So what it means is that when we take the sequence of its inverses, it goes to zero. It cannot have any fixed points. So it means that our current chain meets the dominating quantity infinitely often, similarly to an argument which appears in Sarig's coding, where he uses the this fact again with the appropriate i function. Um, and now we are able to define i maximality, which one can again compare with epsilon maximality, which is the following. I maximality means that Assume that we have two chains. Let me remind you one second. We have two chains which code the same point and are current. Then we have this estimate for their centers. Center of chart is a point X for this chart. And so we have this estimate. Then assume that this inequality holds for this parameter PIU for some i, some integer i. Then we write the following equality by definition PUI plus one equals to the maximum over these two quantities. And that's the beauty of the greedy algorithm that we have an explicit formula for the next one in the chain. And then we substitute the fact that PUI is greater or equal than I minus one. We substitute it here. So we have I composed I minus one. We use this commutativity relation. And we use also the, uh, the inequality that this quantity is greater or equal than I minus one of, of this quantity. So, and we can take i minus one outside because it's monotone, so it preserves the maximum. So we are left with i minus one of this maximum, which by definition of the greedy algorithm is i minus one of qi plus one. What we get is that once this property, the inequality holds at one integer, it pulls itself as a bootstrap to all greater or equal integers uh, in the chain. And from the fact that it happens infinitely often in the past, holds for every integer in the chain. And this is the inverse problem. So items one to five are enough. Um, these properties, items one to five are sufficient in order to construct a Markovian cover. But once you have this Markovian cover with the, the properties which correspond to the coding of Sarig, then you can continue with the Bowen and Sarig set theoretical refinement, set theoretical process, it doesn't matter from what a uh, smooth structure it can be forehand, and you get uh, a refinement of the cover into a partition, which is induces a finite to one almost ever coding on the current part. That, uh, that is the same. Um, of course, there is another thing here, which is the fact that for the actual inverse problem, you don't want just the norms to be close to each other. You want the maps to be close to each other, particularly it means the norms, but this is highly technical, so I'm not gonna go into details over. So now um, let's see what, what is the engine that allows us to carry out a gap transform, okay? For simplicity, assume for a second that we're in the two-dimensional setup and define this function, which is a well-defined doesn't depend on a choice of a tangent vector because there's only one tangent vector up to a choice of direction, which is normalized in the unstable uh, subspace. So we choose one uh, normalized unstable tangent vector. And we have this quantity. Now I'm gonna show you uh, a formula, which is true, which is the contraction in chart. This is when we do the change of coordinates. The contraction in chart equals exactly to this quotient, which equals exactly to this factor. Um, and this is dominated by e to the minus uh, one over u square of x. Now, whenever u is very big, then this inequality becomes uh, actually a good approximation. 
of course, we're interested in dealing with the parts in the space which are big and U is big. This is a good approximation. Now let's try to see how the graph transform works in a simplified setup. What is the simplified setup? The simplified setup is when the differential does not contract tangent vectors on the unstable subspace. This is not always true in an uniformly hyperbolic system, but we want it to happen somehow on average because uh, in the end, those contractions, they end up being summable, they go to zero. So on average, it should not expand tangent vectors. So let's just, for simplification, assume that it truly happens on every point of the orbit. So what, one can write this recursive formula, u square of x, just expand this exp the expression here above, and you get it, it equals to two plus a factor times u square of f minus one of x. This factor is less or equal to one by assumption, then it's less or equal to two plus u square of f minus one of x. You divide both sides of the equation appropriately, and you get the following um, inequality. One over u square of f is greater or equal to one over u square, uh, with, uh, we multiply by this factor of e to the minus two over u square. Now, why is this uh, something that we're interested in? So let me do a small drawing here on the side. Imagine that you have two admissible manifolds, and then you start pulling them backwards and steps until you get to some neighborhood of a point. So in each step, they become closer to each other. The rate of how close they get to each other is the con contraction backwards on the unstable direction, which we saw is minus one over u square n. Why n? Because this is the nth step. And then the sum of all contractions or the product of all contractions is one minus u square k when you go up to n. So in order to show that the graph transform converges, you want to show that this sum goes to infinity because when this sum goes to infinity, this quantity goes to zero and we got that indeed there's a limit point. They converge. Um, so let's see how we can show that this, this uh, sum goes to infinity. You use this recursive formula. You use this recursive formula. One over u square composed fn is greater or equal to one over u square, which we take the common factor outside, times the sum of all those uh, bound, bounded factors. And we get that if the left-hand side were to be finite, then it means that the terms in the sum have to go to zero, which means that the sum actually goes to infinity, which is a contradiction. Then you must diverge. Um, so this is the engine which allows for the graph transform. But the fact that I, uh, the reason I chose to show you this simplified setup is because um, in this simplified setup, we get that if you want to rewrite this relationship, you get something of the form when, sorry, i of x equals uh, x e to the power of x, you get that one over u square uh, composed f is greater or equal than i minus one of one over u square. Um, and i minus one or, and u square is what we should have in mind as the inverse Lyapunov norm, okay? So I want to circle back to the definition of strong temperability. Let me go for the, to the definition of strong temperability. In the definition of strong temperability, we have one more argument or one more factor. So it's this little gamma, um, but this gamma uh, doesn't matter because it's factored out here with one over gamma. It's just to give us another degree of freedom uh, in the choosing of strong temperability, but the rate is exactly the same rate requiring a function to be a strongly temperable is exactly requiring that this sequence will be strongly temperable with respect to this function. It's the same requirement. And as we can see here in its very ideal setup, this is sort of the minimal restriction we can have. So the restriction of strong temperability is a minimal in a way. And it's the fact that the, uh, the strong temperability needs to hold with respect to this expression, the inverse Japan of norm, which comes from these sums. And as I try to explain, these are almost uh, optimal in a way because it would be conceptually wrong to try to put an exponent here 
it will either obstruct the Markovian structure or a, a not allow you to code measures with small exponents. Um, okay, so this is the engine which allows us to carry out the gas, gas transform, which tells us that even for weak chains, one can construct weak manifolds, which is nice. Um, they contract, but they may not contract uh, exponentially fast. So uh, a natural question is, are those foliations absolutely continuous with respect to allonomies? And the answer is yes, they are absolutely continuous with respect to allonomies. And then uh, another general fact about the existence of strictly weak foliations, a strictly weak foliation is a weak foliation which uh, whose contraction is strictly sub-exponential. So whenever we are in the presence of small exponents, that means we have uh, some invariant measures where the, uh, the Lyapunov of exponents are not uniformly bounded from below, then you must ha also have strictly weak foliations. Let me explain the construction. It's uh, quite straightforward. You start with the fact that given a, peri a sorry, invariant probability measures with small exponents, one can construct periodic orbits, which have a small exponents. Um, if they all belong to the same homoclinic class, they can be coded transitively due to Buzik, Covici, and Said. And once you have a periodic orbits on a transitive uh, shift space uh, with weak exponents, then one can concatenate them cleverly in a way which makes sure that first the chain that the concatenated chain is recurrent, but also that the, the tail property, the exponent to the tail would be zero. So you get a chain, you get it, it must uh, induce an unstable leaf or a stable leaf, and it will have a sub-exponential contraction. Um, and now let me make another remark to justify this setup. So a very interesting setup to work in is this setup where we have a C infinity surface deformorphism. And you may assume that the pressure over measures with positive entropy of the geometric potential is zero. That's uh, an interesting enough on its own setup to try to fully understand. If you assume in this setup that for all in probability measures, the Lyapunov exponents are bounded from below, then the result of Buzekovic and Sarik tells you that there is an SRB. So you could say that this case is solved. This is exactly the converse to our assumption. So a motivation for this setup is that in all cases, when we don't know that they are solved, we don't know that there is SRB, you do have strictly weak foliations. So uh, it might be interesting to understand. Okay. Could I ask a question? Could I ask a question, please? Sure, sure, could sure. Ask a question? Could I ask a question, please? What is a strictly weak foliation? What, what is a strictly, strictly weak foliation? Strictly means strictly mean? that the contraction is strictly sub-exponential. Uh -huh. Okay. The Thank exponent, you. the Lyapunov uh -huh. exponent okay. is zero. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Sure. Great, thanks. Um, be because otherwise we just know contraction, but we didn't give low, uh, sorry, lower bound on the contraction, which is upper bound on the, okay, so, sure. Um, now let me discuss some examples. So I was very happy this week to see that almost a lot of systems is something in the, which gets a lot of attention, attention. So I don't need to put a lot of time into defining them. Turns out that the audience is familiar with this con construction, but just let me um, um, mention it one more time. So a definition due to Hu and Yang is given a two dimensional torus and F is a, a C a deformorphism of the torus where R is greater or equal to two, but it's also allowed to be infinity. Uh, it's required to be topologically transitive. It's required to have one in different fixed point. And you want to have every, everywhere on the manifold a splitting of the tangent space such that on the stable subspace, there is uniform contraction everywhere with some k, k s smaller than one. On the unstable subspace, you get that there is never a contraction, but there's always expansion except for one point, the point P. And at P, there's no uh, no expansion is no expansion at all. So the result of Wu and Yang say that this setup is enough to show that there are no SLB measures. Now let me uh, tell you a theorem: is that first every point in this system, aside for the uh, indifferent fixed point, 
is zero summable. And um, uh, our coding can code all invariant probability measures aside for the delta measure at, at the different fixed point, uh, all of the invariant uh, probability measures simultaneously uh, in a finite to one almost everywhere fashion while uh, you have measures with arbitrarily small exponents. Um, now there's work in progress, which I want to mention. So my argument is not complete for this result. Um, when, if anyone is interested, I can explain why I think it should be completed. I don't know, soon or sometime, but uh, I will mention this result and then I will show a corollary why I'm trying to prove this result, why it's interesting this result to me. Um, okay, so what we do know first, there are some notions of almost an of systems where uh, you have a non-degenerate form around the indifferent fixed point, which allows for the for finite SLB measures. And in this case, we can show that we can code Lebesgue almost every point um, using the absolute continuity of, um, of the, in fact, here you don't need the weak foliation, it's enough than the absolute continuity of uh, exponential foliations, but um, you can show that you can code Lebesgue almost every point while there is no invariant density. Now, what I, the, where the argument is not complete yet is in the setup mentioned here, when you do not have a finite SLB measure, then we would still be able to code a Lebesgue almost every point recurrently on, in fact, it's enough for us on unstable ifs. And in this setup, it's also true that the Lyapunov exponent for Lebesgue almost every point is zero. But it's not an obstruction for the coding as I explained. Now, there is a co immediate corollary from this property. I will not explain how to derive it. It's a well cantelli argument, uh, which uses properties of the symbolic space. And, and I, I, it's written somewhere else, but it's technical, so I will not explain it today. Um, which says that if this property holds, then the pressure of the geometric potential is zero on sigma zero. Sigma zero is the uh, coding of uh, the recurrently strongly temporal points where we allow for zero exponent. This holds, given that we can code given one, this holds, while simultaneously, another thing that holds is that for every chi, the coding on the chi symbolic space, the symbolic coding of a uh, chi hyperbolic measures must be strictly less than zero. So let me just explain why this is true, okay? For now, don't read this, let's just read this box. So why the pressure on the sigma chi is less than zero for a chi greater than zero? Um, assume otherwise, assume that the pressure here is, is zero, then you can find the sequence of measures mu n, which approximate the pressure, this pressure goes to zero, but simultaneously their Lyapunov exponent is bounded from below. Then it follows that their entropy is bounded from below. Um, now, a, it means that the limiting point must be an SLB. I'll show why. Because first of all, the real inequality tells us that we have a bound from above uh, by zero for the, uh, for the limiting measure. But also you can decompose this into the difference of the entropy with the sequence, element, the sequence elements and the difference of the integral over the geometric potential plus the pressure of the sequence element. This goes to zero by the choice of the sequence. This goes to zero because they converge in a weak star topology and phi is continuous. And in C infinity, this is greater or equal to zero by the upper semi-continuity of entropy. Then you get that you have a limiting measure which satisfies entropy formula and has non-zero entropy. It must be an SLB. This is a contradiction to the result of Wu and Yang. Therefore, the pressure must be strictly less than zero on every sigma chi. So we are not able to capture this phenomenon where we have a sequence of measures which want to approximate the pressure, the pressure is zero. You want to approximate the pressure, but it escapes every uh, sigma chi coding. You're not able to capture this sequence. And the reason that you are losing something uh, important here is when you're not able to capture the, the diffusing process, you're not able to capture its limiting, uh, the limiting of the process. And the limiting of the process is that the geometric potential would have zero pressure and will be null car on the sigma naught space. Um, so you truly are missing a symbolic description of this phenomenology where entropy diffuses. And it happens also with C infinity uh, examples. So as I said, 
this can all be shown given the fact that this argument is not complete yet. But I will say it if anyone is interested, I will explain why I think it should be true. Now, the following slide might, uh, some people might not like it, but I feel obligated to show it because I said that every point is a zero summable, so I feel obligated to explain how. So the idea of, of how to show that is the following. First, you take some approximation, a Taylor expansion of the action of the differential on the unstable direction in the different fixed point. Let's call it, uh, actually, let's call it F minus one because we are interested in F. Then you want the inverse. The first step is to show the relationship between the Taylor expansions of F and its inverse. Then you notice that Fn of x must go to zero because of the same argument we said before. It has no fixed points, this expression, aside from zero. Um, and then you use some nice equation argument to show the following. I, these constants are important. I'm sorry that they may look messy, but they are crucial. I will try to explain why, but you need to get a bound on the rate of how, how slow this goes to zero. Why do you need to get a bound on the rate with the constant, the exact constant? It's so important that you want to also control the error term to show that it goes to zero. Uh, I'll explain in a second. This constant ends up being an exponent. Um, uh, so you need to show that this, uh, you need to be able to show this bound. In fact, it's not only a bound, it's, it characterizes the rate up to the actual constant. And what happens is that uh, you end up showing something of the following form. You end up showing, let's call this for a second C. Then you end up showing that you have a bound, which is of the form of um, one minus, uh, minus, oh, sorry, C over N. We have uh, to the power of R minus one. So it cancels, cancels with the one over R minus one here. And this is kind of like e to the minus c r minus one times log, if you take the sum up to n, times to log n, which is one over n to c r minus one. So in order to have some ability of these terms over capital N, you have to show that the exponent uh, is sufficiently nice. So you need to control it. So you have to control this constant properly. And that's indeed what you get. You get a bound on the nth derivative, which is a constant over n to the power of r over r minus one. So it means that for every alpha, which is greater than r minus one over r, this is even smaller than one. This uh, sum is finite. In particular, two is greater than this quantity. Um, so you get that you are summable. Um, okay. I know it was technical, but I had some obligation to show it. And good, so now we can discuss codability. It may not be a priori clear what measures are carried by the currently strongly temperable points. And so let's show a condition, okay? The condition which is sufficient is the following. We want the square of the inverse Lyapunov of norm to be sublinear. And if this is also almost optimal, I mean, it's enough to have big O with some constant, but this constant will have to depend on our choice of gamma and epsilon. And of course, we want the construction to work for every gamma and epsilon. So you want it to be a little O. And as I said, the strong temporability is also optimal because we have a very nicely behaving setups where this is exactly the bound that is the, uh, which appears. Um, so why is this uh, sufficient to show coding? Why this condition is sufficient? Um, it's because uh, consider that assume that for some uh, fixed delta we'll determine later, this inequality holds for every n. In fact, it hold, holds for every large enough n, but for simplification, assume it holds for every n. Then define qn to be exactly one over delta n to the power of gamma. Then by definition, this quotient equals to this quotient to the power of gamma which again is very similar to E minus gamma over N. You substitute the formula for one over N to QN and you get this expression. And this expression, if you choose Delta small, it will be greater or equal uh, to this. So this is exactly what we need. You multiply both sides of the equation. This moves here and this moves here. You get this inequality. This is exactly the definition of IQ of N. And you indeed get that QN is greater or equal than I minus one of Q and minus one, which is the strong temperability you want. So strong temperability is basically this property. And it's interesting to see when, 
when it holds. So let's see one condition which shows it. Um, one condition is if the inverse Lyapun of norm is integrable, but in fact, we uh, can use a um, weaker condition, which is that the difference of the inverse Lyapun of norm square and in, in its image with F is uh, integrable. And what happens in almost a of systems is that U square composition- I'm sorry, there I'm is sorry, a power there is in both, both of them? Both of them? Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, what happens in almost a of systems is that this difference is bounded by two. Let me remind you, which we actually saw it. I don't know if you picked it up, but we showed it. And where did we see it here? We assume the setup where there is no contraction and unstable. Oops. We assume uh, this setup and we got the two square facts is less or equal to two plus. This. So the difference is indeed bounded by two. So what we get is that this function is one sided integrable, but because of the specific form of this function, one can lift the one sided integrability into an integrability. Which is what we want. This is the integrability in this case because u square is up to a constant, the inverse the upon of norm. The s parameter is uniformly bounded. Um, so we get that indeed we can code every invariant measure aside for delta p uh, in almost a of systems. This is how we show that you code them. Um, I want to point out another thing is that we all we can always lift the pressure of every uh, Helder continuous potential. Why is that? Because uh, the pressure is can always be approximated by uniformly hyperbolic uh, measures, and uniformly hyperbolic measures have little q bounded uh, from below uniformly. So of course, it's a, it doesn't grow uh, more than linearly; it's bounded. So you can code all periodic orbits. You can code you can code all um, you can code all uniformly hyperbolic measures. You can lift always the pressure. To, to this new symbolic space. And there are many measures which satisfy this because the fact that you can code all periodic orbits in a Markovian structure in a transitive way gives you some shift space, which exists. You just pick some Markovian measure on the on shift space and project it below. The projection will be strongly temporal. It's a Markovian measure which uh, lives on, on unstable list. And in fact, it will have to be hyperbolic. This, if it's a finite measure, it will have to be hyperbolic. And, I will touch upon it later on, but uh, so these measures exist. So there's a challenge, which is to try and figure out which measures as a general class satisfy this property. And that's uh, another uh, ongoing work or in progress, but not uh, on, in the finalizing steps now. Um, good, so the last uh, slide I wanted to show is this nice, a relationship between temperability and, and rate of contraction. So first, define this parameter S square, similar to how we defined U square. And notice that the contraction after N iterates is up to a constant, uh, this sum of one over S square of Fj. So uh, why it's true, because we saw what happens to the contraction after a change of coordinates, it's almost inequality. It's a bound from above, but uh, it's very tight when S is big. And when if S is not big, then we're good. Um, good, so what, what follows from this expression is that a point is hyperbolic if and only if it visits some level set of one over or in fact S square uh, and U square uh, with positive recurrence. So in particular, every in run probability measure, which is carried by the zero summable points, has to be hyperbolic. And hyperbolicity uh, rises, is generated through the positive recurrence. The positive recurrence generates hyperbolicity. But one may have orbits, which may still carry interesting measures, perhaps infinite, which uh, are recurrent and are not positive recurrent. And then one can get other rates of contraction. So let me show one thing. Um, Consider the function f of n equals e to the power of delta n, exponential function. Then it satisfies that the derivative of f over f equals delta, which is positive, and it's uniformly bounded from below. 
So if one uh, considers another function, f for which it's not bounded from below, let's say it goes to zero monotonically, you have this equation. You can put any uh, other function on the right-hand side which satisfies this property and then solve the differential equation. For example, you can find a, a stretch exponential rate. So if one wants to, uh, if you have such a function and you have the property that you have this kind of temporability, that the inversely upon of norm square is less or equal to f of n over f, f prime of n, which goes to infinity because this goes to zero, then you get the following. You get that the accumulative contraction after sufficiently many steps uh, is uh, less or equal to one over c of the inverse of this, which because this goes to zero monotonically, it's like taking up to a, a constant e minus uh, one over c to the integral of, of this expression. But this expression is the derivative of log f. So you get that it equals to one over f of n to the power of one over c. In particular, when you have a sublinear rate like we wanted, uh, you get that you must have super polynomial, uh, super polynomial contraction. Uh, and one can try to tailor even stronger. You can try to get a stretch exponential if you can show stronger things. And the reason that this is uh, interesting is because temperability rates is an object which is easier to study. You have level of, uh, sets of a function and one can try to use ergodic properties in order to find some asymptotic uh, growth bound on this function. And once you have some asymptotic growth bound through, if you have quantitative information on return times, let's say, if you have quantitative information, then one can use this quantitative information on the, on the rate of return times to get quantitative information on temporability, which ends up giving you interesting contraction rates on uh, weekly unstable rates. That's why I showed it. Um, so if we, the work in progress, if the argument is complete in particular, so we have this infinite SLB measure in almost a of systems, which of course, uh, almost every point has the Lyapunov of exponent zero on the unstable direction, but you would still have super polynomial contraction on the unstable direction. Um, so the one thing, last thing I wanted to say before uh, I finish is to thank, let me stop the screen sharing. is to thank, oh, thank you. It's to thank the organizers for this week and the name of everyone in the audience. So thank you. Okay, thank you very time. much. Congratulations. Okay, uh, are there any questions? Okay, I have a question. So uh, the dream is you have a system such that Lebesgue almost every point is zero Lyapunov exponent. But uh, maybe on your coding, you can use your coding to construct an infinite measure with, such that almost every point is a weak unstable and weak stable manifold and absolutely continuous conditionals on unstables, weak, weak unstables. That's a uh, one version of the dream. Um, I, I don't want the, the condition in this generality, but I do want to try and figure out a sort of dichotomy or trichotomy between different possible uh, thermodynamic properties of the geometric potential when first you assume that the pressure is zero. Then you can restrict to the cases when it's strictly less than zero and then you know the dimension on unstable if will be, uh, you, you will not have hope to get physical measures this way because the dimension will be bounded from one. But in principle, the, the additional power that you get by coding uh, non-hyperbolic but zero summable points is that maybe these points and the Markov structure can allow you to construct interesting infinite measures, which have on the one hand zero yeah. exponents, but on the other hand, some type of quasi hyperbolic structure. Exactly. So it will be a Markovian structure on the one hand, but you can capture a phenomenon completely of the diffusion of entropy, which we have examples when it happens and you want to capture this and it's limiting a uh, process. So you end up finding the null current process, which happens in terms of your thermodynamic formalism with finding a null current SLB measure. That's, that's the, the goal. Another question. Uh, so by coding by, by one single transitive shift or zero summable orbits, you are able, if I understand correctly, to code at once all hyperbolic measures without any, any lower bound on the hyperbolicity? 
you can code all measures which are carried by the recurrently strongly temporable set. In the almost on of systems, it happens for every environment probability system. But the question which I'm working on, and I think is hard for me, is to see in what generality one can prove that uh, a measure is carried by this set. I have some speculations, but I, I want to say that you always lift, in any case, you can always code all periodic orbits, which, uh, which are hyperbolic. You can always lift the uniformly hyperbolic, so you lift pressure. You have measures which are strongly temperable always, and you could construct strictly weak foliations always. Um, and the, the goal is to show that for some interesting measures, that is equilibrium um, uh, measures of uh, held continuous potential, the local product structure plus some other Gibbs estimate or sort of Gibbs estimate uh, will allow you to show strong temperability. And, and then they should, I hope, to be able to code them as well. But that's my goal. I see. Oh, wonderful. Great. Any other questions? Stefano? Yes, very nice. Thank you, Snail. Very nice uh, talk. So in the, in the almost an Ozov example, of course, you, I guess you are not able to use the full power of your construction of the stable leaves because they are already there, right? Uh, I'm not. I, not. What do you mean I'm not able? No, in the uh, sense I, it's that- It's not needed. It's not, it's needed. not needed. Yes, it's not yeah. needed. Yes. Okay. True. So, yeah. So do you do you think um, it would be nice to see an example where really you you don't know a priori that there is a, such a foliation, right? Or I guess it's very hard to verify. No, it's it's not hard. As I explained, um, you just need an example where the Lyapunov exponents are not bounded from below. Once you have such a system, I, I haven't tried to construct a system, but I'm sure there are systems where the Lyapunov exponents are not bounded from below. Once you have that you can construct a, a periodic orbits where the Lyapunov exponents are not bounded from below. And once you have that, you can construct a null recurrent uh, chain uh, for which you would have to have strictly sub-exponential contraction. They exist, these foliations exist. They're intertwined with the exponential contraction uh, foliation, okay. um, but we didn't see them. And nonetheless, they are absolutely continuous and they exist. So, so you're saying that you would you would have a sequence of hyperbolic measures, each one with its own foliation, but then you would necessarily have some, some of these non-exponential foliations. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a limiting process where the, it, uh, the exponentiality uh, goes away. Um, and the thing is that those foliations, they don't carry invariant probability measures, as we said. An invariant probability right. measure would have to be in positive recurrence implies repairability. Right. So what, what, what do they carry? They exist geometrically, but they can carry infinite measures. That's what they can carry, which can still be interesting, physical, and so on. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. And so it's time to finish this uh, very interesting week with a lot of interesting talks. And uh, let's hope we can meet very soon in person at some place, preferably at the ICTP. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, for coming. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you.